Welcome to the Rex Chapman Show with my super dope homeboy from the Lex Town, Josh Hopkins. Episode 48. What's up, Josh? What's happening, Rex? How are you, buddy? We had a little break. In there looks a little overcast today, a little, huh? A little overcast, but I, I like it. Mixed it up a little bit. It's been beautiful here. Uh, yeah. Um, what about you? How you doing, buddy? I'm good, man. Austin's treating me well. It's been triple digits for like 40 days in a row. But uh, some like it hot and they sweat when the heat is on. And that's me, too. I do that. Wow. <laughs> You're tough like that, though. Yeah. You are tough like that. Um, we got a great guest today. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you who it is. Ready? All right. It's yeah. Gary Williams, Hall of Fame coach Gary Williams, and my former neighbor. Coach. I'm sure. I'm sure we'll get into that. I can't wait to talk to him. Let's do book club. Um, All right. For the last couple of weeks, well, I was in summer league for a bit and had a lot of yeah. time there. I didn't read anything. Didn't didn't read anything at all. Haven't read anything. You? Well, I was gonna say I think I read Star Wars, um, <laughs> but then I remember. There you go again. What? It's a Why? movie. It's a movie. It's good. <laughs> Harrison Ford was in it. Oh yeah, a oh, read. Yeah. No, no, no. I didn't yeah. read any. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's all right. Book club. Okay. Forty-eight. What are some forty-eight? Forty-eight. Forty-eight. Uh, a tough one. I, I don't know any 48s. Do you? Can you think of one? I bet you can. Kentucky Wildcat. Or 48 one. for a year or two. Not at Kentucky. Nazi Mom. You can't. Nazi Mom. Really? Muhammad. Yeah. That's a good pull. We need to, we need to have Nas on and ask him. We need to have Nazi on and ask him why. Why 48? Yeah. How, how would one go with 48? That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, to uh, me, like, like I say, that's how I remember numbers, like people's phone number, your locker. And that one, I couldn't go with Nazi Muhammad 48. No, that has to be 48. Like Kyle Macy, <laughs> Kobe Bryant. Mm -hmm. That's how I'd go. I'd go, oh, yeah. it's 48. It's Kyle Macy, Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant. That's, that's how I would. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, Josh, we had a big loss this weekend. In the basketball world and uh, in the world, in the world um, Bill Russell passed away, 88 years old, um, a long, amazing life. The guy, I guess, arguably or maybe even inarguably the greatest winner in American sports of all time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Two-time NCAA winner. I think they went. he went 10-0 and in game sevens. He won 11 championships and only has 10 rings uh, with the Celtics, uh, 10 fingers, um, 11 championships, 11 rings, 10 fingers. That's amazing. Um, and an and, uh, uh, Olympic gold medal. Olympic gold medal, Olympic gold medal. was a high jumper, um, mm -hmm. track star, just an amazing, amazing athlete. I, um, I, I met, met him handful of times and um he always lived up to his demeanor and right. it was um it could be cool you consider it, yeah. it to be cool at times um right. and if you didn't know anything about him you might think something about that but knowing everything that was available to know about him as a young person, I understood why he was the way he was. He was always nice, always respectful. Um, but man, what a, what an icon, what a loss. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the first things you think about when you think of him is it's not just on the basketball court, it's off. It's his, his social yeah. stances, you know, um, the, the way he, he, he was in that time. He stood up. He stood up and and against uh, what was good for his bank account, and stood up for his morals and and what he really believed in. You know, the thing about him was he uh, was known as such an intelligent uh, gentleman, but he, he was suffered no fools. No. 
And that oh. was always interesting about him because of that, that part of him was, he wasn't just, uh, he was never out there just to make people happy. He was out there. He was himself always. Yeah. He never, never put, put it on. And, and it was always, um, he just, always every time anyone spoke about him it always was such reverence about his character yeah he played in an era man can you imagine i mean we again we grew up in a time where yes we knew what history was but it also wasn't access as accessible to see to visually see as it is now mm -hmm. um you know but there's footage of there's pictures and and whatnot and i remember talking to wes unseld about this way back in the day they played in an era where you know in college if they went to uh, a certain restaurant their white teammates could go in they couldn't go in yeah can, can you imagine i i can't even mm -hmm. fathom uh you know mm -hmm. living in that time much less being on a team uh, that's integrated, but society's not, that's, that's messed up. It's messed that's up. That's one of the things yeah, as, as we get older, the, you get this because, you know, when I'm 15 and hearing about that, I, I'm like, that was back when a uh, hundred years ago. Yeah, that exactly. Was, yeah, that was, yeah, no, dinosaur, it wasn't two was decades ago. ago. I know. Yeah. I know yeah, uh, that was not long and he, he just passed and he lived and fought through all of that and uh, and did what he did and stood where he stood. It's just an amazing, amazing man, a big loss, uh, but a man who definitely put his um, imprint on all our lives. So it is a big loss. Um, and he well was said. Missed. well said. Um, all right, Josh, you know what? Let's get right into our talk. I want to talk to my former neighbor in Woodmore, Maryland, what? Naismith Hall of Fame class of 2014, 2002 national championship coach for the Maryland Terrapins, 668 career wins, two-time ACC coach of the year. We have Gary Bruce Williams. Welcome, coach. How are you, buddy? Rex, I'm good. What'd you do? Live in Woodmore or someplace? I lived in I lived in Woodmore over there beside yeah, you for I was I, Bernard was up in. Bernard King was over there. We had a yeah. we had a neighbor. I think uh, Susan O'Malley was over there for yes, a bit, yes. right? We had yeah, quite yeah. a neighborhood right down from the old Cap Center. How about that place? Yeah, that was a that was a great place. Uh, I mean, the guys who played uh, ball there, the teams that played there, they're just amazing. Steph Curry's record-breaking three-pointer, Jason Tatum's buzzer-beating alley-oop, Ja Morant's poster dunk. NBA Top Shot is where the greatest moments from NBA history are turned into officially licensed digital collectibles. NBA Top Shot has evolved trading cards by making it easier to buy, sell, and collect by removing the hassle of grading, shoe boxes, and shipping fees. You can buy or sell moments in a few clicks and access them at any time on your phone or computer. Your collection is always at your fingertips. Start collecting Top Shot moments in any way you want. Collect rookie moments from future stars like Evan Mobley and Kay Cunningham. Collect throwback moments from former NBA stars like Shaq and Allen Iverson. Or collect moments from your favorite team to gain access to exclusive perks. Grab your starter pack today and Top Shot will give you $20 back to start your collection and pick up some of your favorite moments in the marketplace. Go to about.com nbatopshot.com slash bballnews and get in the game today. Coach, thanks for doing this. Being a, being a Jersey guy, 76ers fan, how would you compare one of your idols like Guy Rogers uh, compared to someone you grew up hating in Bob Cousy? That's funny you mentioned those two guys. They, they were, you know, I was small. I was six feet max and they were six feet or Cousy might have been six two. It, you know, as a kid, back then, you saw one game a week on television. It was Saturday afternoon, and it was always Boston because they were the best. You know, Russell, all those guys, they were winning all those championships. And Cousy was a guy you weren't allowed to be. In other words, when you play a pickup game outside, I was always going to be Guy Rogers. I couldn't be Bob Cousy because he was a Celtic. But I love Cousy, you know, behind the back. between Nobody – remember back then, coaches wouldn't even – think of letting you do that 
you know, you, right. you couldn't do those things. So, you know, secretly you love Koozie, but I was Guy Rogers every time I played a pickup game. That's fantastic. Uh, speaking of which, I, I we can't let this go. Well, uh, Bill Russell passed away. Uh, oh. Give me your thoughts on on him. You know, Josh and I were 50s, a little over 50. And by the time, you know, he was, by the time I started playing ball and knowing about basketball, he'd already retired. Talk right. to us a little bit about Bill Russell, coach. Well, he, I, I think the, the first thing comes to my mind, he won two NCAA championships. He won a gold medal and he won, I guess, 11 championships with the Celtics. And just that alone, um, you know, and that's all different players. So his ability to adjust to his teammates, I think, is very underrated. And the fact that he was the anchor, he was like their goalie on their defense. Nobody could get to the rim. Uh, he was in such good shape. You know, they talk, they, they talk about him being able to play today. Well, he'd outrun a lot of guys today at that 6'9", 6'10", size. And he was left-handed, which I always thought was a tremendous advantage uh, for him. And he just played to win. You know, that's the best way. You, 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 I'm sure you've played with a lot of guys who are really talented, but oh, yeah. somehow you didn't win, you know. And, and finding those guys that win, I, I think that's – Nowadays, that's one of the more underrated things um, in recruiting in college basketball is who can win. And then with Russell, that you didn't have to worry about that. And, and for our Red Auerbach, great coach, but to have Bill Russell coming every day to practice every day, every game with the idea, we've, we've got to win this. I don't care if it's a drill. I don't care if it's a game. But we, we've got to win this. Uh, that's just a tremendous thing. And, and uh, obviously what he did off the court, social justice, things like that. Uh, not being afraid to take what a stand. That, what was that like? Uh, you know, well, because again, that, that Josh man, and I were too young to remember that. Yeah. What was that well, like that for even was, for uh, you going through it? That one picture with Jim Brown, uh, Kareem, uh, Bill Russell, um, you, you know, and Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of the country wanted Muhammad Ali to go to jail. People yeah. for, forgot that because he 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 avoided the draft, you know, and he wow. broke. A thing and, and so they had to fight all that and to come out to be on the side of Muhammad Ali that really hurt Russell's persona for a while with, with fans wow. and with people but you know the, the one thing Russell I, I thought was great at no matter what was going on when it came time to play he could really focus on that game and that, that's where he was tremendous you know these guys that have to take games off today because they're tired, <laughs> even though they're probably making four hundred thousand dollars to play that game, that one game. Uh, Russell would never, in his mind, think of doing something like that. And you know he he was he was great for kids. He was a great role model for kids because he didn't he didn't take crap off anybody. But yet he knew he always played a team game. I mean, I think he averaged sixteen points a game for his career. But you know what he did on off. I mean, his outlet passes, you don't see outlet passes like he made uh, back when he played. And he could throw a baseball pass left-handed, um, the length of the court. And then sometimes he'd take it and put it on the floor. Bill Russell was a great high jumper in college. He, he, was, he was a great athlete. People forget that. He played against probably as good an athlete to ever play in the NBA against Will Chamberlain. Every year they'd play 16 times plus the playoffs. I mean, people forget there was only, you know, eight teams, 10 teams back then. And he'd do all that. He was incredible. I, I watched and went back and watched a video yesterday, just sort of a montage of him playing. And there was that there's this one possession where he gets a rebound on one end and there are two guys parallel with him. He took five dribbles, but only one passed half court and laid it yeah. in the basket, hit the baseline, and he had beaten all 10 guys down the floor to shoot a layup. I mean, the speed that he had, the agility. Yeah. I think people forget that. Um, and his intelligence, like when he played against Chamberlain, there's no way he could beat Chamberlain in terms of strength versus strength. So what he did, he, you know, he picked Wild up a little further out, bump him out where he couldn't get to where he could do that dipper move that he had, you know, where he just laid yeah. the ball in because he was, you know, probably 7-2, uh, Will was. And, and, you know, just little things, blocking shots, keeping the ball in the court, not trying to knock it eight rows into the stands. He was the first guy to, to really do that. And I think 
he was really the first player to show the impact of a block shot. Because if you can keep those things on the court, you usually score down the other end. And, you know, and, and then the rebounding thing. Uh, I got a chance to talk to him one time. And he, he, he you know, he was very guarded with, with you know, mm-hmm. with everything that happened in his life. I'm sure, you know, yep. you develop whatever you are. But it was at Michael Jordan's uh, fantasy camp in Las Vegas. And they had, uh, My- Michael Jordan had, uh, Russell there, he had uh, Havlicek, Oscar Robertson, uh, wow. Jerry West. They were, all, they were all there. So I, I kind of sat down next to Robertson at, at one of the clinics, at, or next to Russell, one of the clinics they were doing. And I just turned, you know, I, here I am. I mean, I, I was a 10-year-old kid, you know, watching, you know, this, this God play basketball. Yeah. And I, I said, Mr. Russell, uh, you know, I always wondered uh, why you always seem to get to the ball faster than most rebounders you know you somehow you you, you got there faster and he, he didn't say anything and i said oh I, bro- I broke the code you know i talked <laughs> but then he turned and he said young man which i i really appreciated because i wasn't that young man but he said young man <laughs> just so you know when, when if you're a good rebounder you never stay still on defense even though your man may be staying still he said the ball guides you to where it's coming off the, the rim and then he said you must play flex and i kind of looked at him he, you never stand straight up because the ball might come off quick and you have to be able to jump quick. And he said, even though you don't get up real high, you get to the ball quicker than the other players if the ball comes off quick. And then he turned and just, you know, watched the clinic. That was it. But it was great. You know, you got to play flex, flex, defense, uh, basically athletic position. Correct. Sure. Yeah. 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 So great. And he, and he, he didn't do it talking down to me. He just, yeah. you know, was very, you know, broke it uh, down. Clinical, you know, there, there was no laughing or anything like that. It was just, this is, I asked him a question. He answered the question. It was, it was tremendous. I've, uh, I've, I feel so fortunate to, at this point in my life, be a, a basketball lifer. You're a basketball lifer coach. When did you know that was going to be the case? Uh, when did you hope that was going to be the case? And did you think it would be as a coach? or a player, or what? Well, I, I was fortunate. Uh, growing up in uh, South Jersey, right across uh, from Philadelphia, really 20 minutes from the Palestra in Philadelphia, for example, uh, I was going to be a basketball player in my mind. Uh, I remember playing on a team when I was eight years old, so I played early. And uh, I just loved the game. And back then, you played all the sports. You played football and baseball. Yeah. But there was something about basketball. I, I, I just – like the idea of being involved in every play. You're, you're, you're not in football. You're not in baseball. In basketball, you're basically involved in every play. So I like that. And uh, I had a great high school coach. John Smith was his name, still alive, um, up wow. in New Jersey. And he kept me on the straight and narrow. He, he made me go to class. He, he was the only reason I had good enough grades to go to college. So now I go to college and I'm thinking, man, I'm, I'm going to the ACC. I'm going to Maryland. I'm going to play in the NBA. So back then, freshmen had to play freshmen. Freshmen. Uh, you didn't play right. varsity. So we had a good freshman team. I think we were 16 and one. And the next step was to play varsity. So I get out there and uh, as a sophomore, and I'm playing. Uh, we're playing North Carolina, and they had a guy named Billy Cunningham. Decent player. <laughs> like, Decent player. You know, I wasn't guarding <laughs> Billy Cunningham, believe me. But I was guarding a guy in the corner. But Billy had the ball on the top of the circle, and we had scouted him. Billy loved to go to his left. He was left-handed. And, you know, I, I knew what he was going to do. So I got off the guy in the corner, got right in the middle of the lane, and I was going to take the charge. And I had him. He took off, like, right inside the foul line. And I had him. Next thing I saw was this converse going over my right shoulder as he dunked it on me. And right about then, I thought, eh, maybe, maybe you're not going to play in the NBA. <laughs> you know, And like, <laughs> that's where – but, see, I was really fortunate. Dean Smith had – had gotten to North Carolina. So he was there. Frank McGuire was in the league. Um, you know, th- there, there was uh, really great coaches in the, in the ACC back in the day and Bones McKinney at Wake Forest, people like that, that, you know, really kind of were in there not to make money because nobody was, you know, John Wooden wasn't making money back then. So no one was making right. money. And so, you know, you love the game. And I, I gradually decided that that's what I wanted to do. I, I was a business major. I didn't like any of the courses I took. I, you know, I wasn't a good student. You know, I struggled to get through, but I loved anything to do with basketball. I, I was good. You know, I was fine. 
So I got a JV coaching job back in Camden, New Jersey, uh, in, at the high school level, which probably kept me out of the Vietnam War, to be honest with you, because wow. uh, everybody in 67, yeah. 68 was going to yep. Vietnam. All, all males were, were gone back then. And so I was, I, it was considered a deprived area by my draft board. So they needed teachers. And that's how I got into coaching. And very fortunate. Very fortunate. Wow. Wow. That, Did, uh, was that Woodrow go, Wilson? Woodrow Wilson, yeah. That, the Camden is the other. That. That's the Camden has is the big school, and this they have the great player Wagner, the the third yep. Wagner to come along yep. now, and hopefully Rexy goes to Kentucky, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's big right. big big battle going on right now oh, between yeah. Louisville and Kentucky. You know, you know how that is, Coach. You, you was you won was a that state the, championship there as head coach, correct? Yeah, in nineteen seventy, I was the head coach the next year. I was twenty four years old. Uh, we went undefeated. We were 27 or no. We, we uh, beat East Orange in the state championship game in front of 9,000 people in Atlantic City Convention Hall where they used to have the Miss America contest. They put a court down. And wow. uh, it, it was wow. incredible. The score of the game, eight minute quarters, no three point line. It was 86 78 because neither team was going to back off. You know, we, we just went after wow. it. It was one of, what the, an you know, experience. of all the games I coached. That that was as big a thrill as anything I ever did. You when know, you a lot, read... of, lot of guys ahead, we Jeff. have on here say, you know, their their favorite time. Rex says their his favorite time of, of his athletic career was high school with the guys you grew up with. And, that you know, yeah. how, of course, I would suspect that your – um, championship at Maryland was your coaching high, but how how does that compare to winning the state championship? That had to well, be. It's, you do what you can do wherever you are. I mean, I, I was a high school coach, and we, you know we were the best team in New Jersey that year, and that, that was you know growing a kid growing up in Jersey. That that was a big thrill. Of course, twenty four years old, you, you go twenty seven and zero, and you think, well, this is easy. You know, coach is gonna, <laughs> that's nothing. You know, they we did that. You know, it's, yeah. And then it, then it gets a little tougher after that. Um, you, you, I don't want to let this go. You mentioned Billy Cunningham. Was that your first time coming across Billy was as a freshman at, uh, yeah. at Maryland? You know, you know how it was uh, back then in the early 60s. You, you didn't get to see didn't many know college people. games. Uh, there, was no, there, there weren't any high school games, uh, basically. So I heard about him, the kangaroo kid. He had yeah. this and to get to play against him, the thing with Billy Cunningham, did you ever play against him? Oh, uh, no. He, he was, oh, no. He was gone. He, was he, gone. Had, he had a wingspan. Like, I think he was only about six seven, but his wingspan yeah. had to be like a seven-footer. He'd, he'd stick his hands out, and, like, he was huge, you know. And so how, does, how, did, how did your relationship evolve to where he then introduces you at your Hall of Fame speech? Well, we, we got – we played against each other that year – and then I was a big Sixers fan, you know, growing up. And uh, he went with the Sixers. And so that, that kind of completed the circle. And I got to know him after that um, in Florida. Uh, I met him through a couple of people. And, you know, we just, you know, became friends. And, you know, he was, he was nice enough um, in 2014 to introduce me at, at the uh, Naismith Hall of Fame, which, you know, to have a, a, a Billy Cunningham level player you know, do that. I, I was hoping they thought I was a player too, instead of a coach when they introduced me. I think they looked at my stats and they figured that out. You know, when, when, when you got to, when you got to Maryland, what year was that uh, as a coach when you were hired? As a coach was 89, 1989. Okay. And so I was, I was traded in, I think 91, 92. I move into Woodmore. You're there. Uh, Bernard King's there. You've been the coach there for a couple of years. Now you, you got in and the school was on probation. Right. I didn't realize, I, I, you know, again, I guess it's just that age. I didn't realize that's where you went to college. I was like, why is Gary Williams yeah. taking the Maryland job? I yeah. just knew you as a, as a college basketball coach. You know, that's, great coach. That's, that's really, that's really interesting because I had a great job at Ohio state. I mean, that yeah. place, you know, everybody says it's a football school. Yeah, it is. It's a, you know, That's what I thought. I was like, bigger. why is he leaving Ohio State? It's bigger. He's football coach is bigger than a governor of the state in Ohio. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm serious about that. You know, yeah. and but they treated the other sports really well because they they had 108 thousand people every Saturday. They played a home game, and, and the uh, the fans 
they'd switch over and don't, you know, and we're talking to a school that had Jerry Lucas, John Havlicek, yep. great players on their own. And, um, you know, it, it was, I would have never left Ohio state if it wasn't Maryland. I mean, that was a career job at Ohio state and the people in the, in the Midwest are, are such great people. Uh, in fact, my daughter still lives in Columbus, uh, you know, she'll never leave. She thinks we're crazy yeah. on the East Coast. So <laughs> you might be right. Uh, Coach, how how daunting was it when you got there? Being on probation back then and having less less scholarships and not the ability to right. go on TV, that was a big deal. How were you able yeah, to they, weather they that storm? Um, I always think about that, why they hit Maryland so hard. Uh, when I got there um, – in 89, the investigation was ongoing. Uh, Bias had died in 86. Yeah. And then uh, another coach came in there and he was fired and there was allegations. Of was it Gary? Coaching. Gary Wade? Hmm? Co- Bob, Bob Wade. Wade. Bob Wade. Bob Wade. Wade. Yeah. I, I and he, he, had been, he had been a great coach at Dunbar. He had Muggsy mm-hmm. folks and all those yep. guys at uh, Dunbar. And he was a hero mm-hmm. in the state of Maryland. So th- there was a backlash from that, too, of mm-hmm. Maryland firing Bob Wade because he, he was a, a tremendous high school coach. And so I walk in there and I, I didn't know the severity, but that whole first year I was there, the NCAA and the school, it was like a battle between the legal teams that were interviewing, yanking players out of practice to talk to the NCAA lawyers and things like wow. that. So the week of the ACC tournament, um, say second week in March, the NCAA came out with their sanctions. So for the next Three years, uh, two years, we couldn't play on live TV and we couldn't play in the NCAA tournament. We had our scholarships reduced by three. And I, what, you know, I said, why, why this severe penalty? And I think a, a lot of it was probably a little bit of a backlash from um, the way the school handled the, bo- the uh, Len Bias yeah. situation. And, you know, you know, the, and, you know, the NCAA, they're, they're, they're like, they have a lot of people on a lot of committees that think they're so special, you know, that they can, you know, they, they almost enjoy that, you know. I, I always felt like they, that they were like still trying to stick it to lefty also. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah. it was almost like, and he had, he wasn't the coach I, I, there. He, Bob had been there since then. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the other thing was, I, I, I really believe that the, that whole thing really hurt the university for a while. They, they, they just thought the basketball program, uh, really hurt the academic reputation of the school. You know how that goes and people, yeah. you know, are judgmental. And, you know, for, and back then, you know, 90, 91, I think Duke won national championships both those years. Carolina was just as good as they were. Yep. Uh, Wake Forest had great teams. Virginia, Terry Holland, you know. And we're trying to play and try to talk to recruit about coming to Maryland. Well, how many times back then it was a big deal to play on television. How many times are going to be on television? None. You know, it's it's like, it was hard, but it it, it made me um, work hard too. You know, that that's the other side of that. If you're, you you have two choices, you can quit and go somewhere else. I probably could have gotten another job or you just dig in and say, here we go. You know, this is either going to be really good eventually, or it'll cost me my job. And because people forget, you know, within five years, if you don't win, yeah, there'll probably be another coach. There. This podcast is brought to you by Branded Bills, the best place online for premium headwear and apparel. Branded Bills has hundreds of designs available, including our popular state collection, where you can show your pride with hats, shirts, hoodies, and more for all 50 states. Are you a company looking to brand your business? Branded Bills also offers custom apparel options that can meet your brand standards with fast turnaround and shipping. To shop or learn more, visit brandedbills.com today. Well, 10 years later, you you had done it. You had brought the program to as good as any of those teams you just talked about in, in, in the ACC and winning titles in the ACC. And then you what uh, went to the Final Four in 2001 One. and won it. Yeah. 2002 what was that like when you, had, when you knew it when you knew you had all that talent when you knew you had to play like going into those seasons were you I, ex, did you think you had the best team in the country those years in 2001 I wasn't sure because we were young uh, we had really good players uh, but we were young and we went through a period we, we lost a game to Duke uh in old cold field house, which probably is good a place to play in the country. Yeah. Uh, we were up, um, 
10 with a minute and 10 seconds left. And Jay Williams hit three threes. And we we missed three fronts of one-on-ones. And, you know, they went into overtime. They beat us in overtime. So we lost four over the next five. And we go to the final four this year. I mean, but the ACC, you can quickly go on a downslide. Because <laughs> once you lose that confidence, yeah. those teams are too good. And uh, so we lost. And then we finally, we got a big win um, at Wake Forest. And, that turned it around. Then we beat Duke at Duke toward the end of the season. And, uh, you know, from there, we, we were good enough to get to the Final Four. And we came out great against – we played Duke four times that year. And we, we come out and, – and, like, you know, that's Battier and um, – Yeah. Uh, the, those guys. The, Dunleavy those and those guys. Dunleavy. Yeah. Oh, they were yeah. really good. And um, we were up 20 in the first half. Got They got it down to 12 at halftime. And then, you know, we – we, we didn't play well the second half. And, it's, you know, things – momentum's funny with officials. Momentum's funny with teams. Yeah. And, uh, we lost the momentum that we had, and they got us. But then that next year, I, I thought we were good enough. We had lost a couple guys off that 2001 team, but we had veterans. We had four guys playing the NBA um, off of the championship team. And we didn't have any McDonald's All-Americans on that team. We all we – all, but back then, guys would stay till their senior year, yeah. junior year, senior year. So, you know, the, the starting lineup, the backcourt was Steve Blake and Juan Dixon. Juan oh. played seven years in the NBA. Uh, Steve Blake played 13. Lonnie Baxter was our center. He played six years in the NBA. And Chris Wilcox was a freak. You know, he, he yeah. could, he, could he, he had the timing that you can't teach. And, yep. You know, so all those guys were really successful. Chris played 11 years, ended up with the Celtics. So, um, very, very, we had our 20th year reunion uh, this year. Oh, man. I can't years. believe it's been 20 years. And they, they come walking in and, you know, here I am. I'm thinking, you know, like I'm not getting old or anything, but these guys are 42 years old. <laughs> I'm oh. going, what happened? And, and like, I know. And you know this, Rex, with teams. The greatest thing. We went to a restaurant in D.C. Uh, Friday night, and then they had a lot of things on campus Saturday. But Friday night, we went to a restaurant. Those guys got on the bus. They took the same seats that they took 20 years ago. <laughs> of course ago. they did. And the same things were being said about each guy. You know, that goes, you, know, you get ripped when you get on a team bus. I mean, that's the way it's going. And it was one of the funnier uh, things that uh, I experienced. That was a great night. That's the best. I, I want to I backtrack a minute because you did go through tough times. In your first tournament appearance uh, at Maryland, you made, this, made a Sweet 16 run. It included right. – an upset win over John Calipari, our John Calipari at Kentucky, yes. at, at UMass. Um, what were your expectations after Joe Smith and Keith Booth uh, came in and were able to make, you know, contributions as freshmen like that? I, I knew uh, – it, it was funny. Keith Booth was rated the best player. He, he had played at Dunbar in Baltimore, uh, Bob Wage, you know, the famous school. And they had won the national championship as juniors uh, at the high school level. And so everybody in the state of Maryland knew who Keith Booth was. Joe Smith was, you know, from Virginia, not as well known. Uh, He didn't really blow up till uh, that summer before his senior year. And Nike used to have this big camp in Indianapolis. Joe goes there and he played on an AAU team with Allen Iverson. So Joe didn't see the ball much, which was great for us. It was, you know, we were hoping Iverson wouldn't pass him the ball, you know, so he wouldn't score. But Joe was one of those guys. He he could do for a six nine guy. He he was a little skinny. He wasn't real strong, but he could run. Uh, he could really shoot. He shot seventy seven percent from the line for his career. Uh, he was he was the first pick in the draft over yep. uh, Stackhouse, over Garnett, mm-hmm. McDice. You know, some great players back then. And, Joe could really play, and, and he and Keith changed. We had we had three um, freshmen that started the year before: uh, Johnny Rhodes, X-ray Hip, and Dwayne Simpkins. And then bringing in Joe Smith and Keith Booth. I didn't know we, we started two freshmen and three sophomores that whole year, and to beat uh, Massachusetts with Camby and some other really good players. Um, that that was really big. That's. That's what turned us around. The game that year, our first game of the year that year, in fact, we played Georgetown in the old Capitol Center, Mm -hmm. uh, which you played in quite a bit. And we upset them. They had Hotel Harrington, and it it was a big game. And uh, Maryland didn't play Georgetown for like 
20 more years. <laughs> of course was, not. It was, it was a big win for our program, for our fans. It was a big win. Uh, coach, I want to ask you about a guy, uh, Silver Spring native, Steve Francis. He, he transferred into Maryland. I had never really right. heard about Steve at all. I was, I was playing in Phoenix at the time. All of a sudden, this young kid pops up. How soon did you realize he was special? Um, and did you feel any sort of responsibility to provide him some stability after his difficult you know, childhood yeah, he- upbringing? His his um, his upbringing was incredible. I mean, both his parents died uh, when he was an early teenager. And there was a fireman in Tacoma Park who basically took him under his wing and he got him to San Jacinto Junior College out mm-hmm. in Texas. And Steve was really unhappy out there. You know, a kid from you know, yeah. the D.C. area, you know, mm-hmm. with tumbleweed coming down the street, maybe or something like that. And, yeah. So he transferred to Allegheny College, and they had a great coach there named Bob Kirk, who was passed. But he 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 was the guy that kind of put his arm around Steve and said, "Hey, you 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 can't screw this up. You're too good. You know, you you you've got to do what you're supposed to do." So we we got a chance to see him play quite a bit, and he had already been like an urban legend. Like he'd come into the Urban Coalition Summer League there in D.C., which is a great summer league. You get like sixty. You know, he's 18, yeah. 19 years old <laughs> going against these guys playing in the NBA. You know, I mean, it was, he was incredible. And so um, we were able to get him and he, he was only there one year, but he was great. Um, we played in the uh, Puerto Rico tournament they used to have in Puerto Rico. And uh, the NBA was on strike. That was the fall the NBA yeah. was on strike. That's right. And so all the highlights on ESPN were college basketball highlights. Mm. So here's Steve Francis. He goes, I think he had, he had 30 against Pittsburgh. And then he had uh, another big game against Tayshaun. It was Tayshaun Prince. So um, it was Kentucky. Kentucky. And, yeah. and then he, 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 did, he, did this, <laughs> he did the same thing against UCLA. You know, it was like, and I knew then he was gone. You know, he was yeah. going to play one year and he was going, but he was great. Uh, ne- never what was easy to coach. P- people wow. think, well, he had to be tough to coach. No, he was easy. He had the best legs of anybody I ever coached. No, nobody got off the floor quicker yeah. than he did. He, he was incredible. Even on his jump shots, he was like on a table when he was shooting his uh, jump shot. He was incredible. Yeah, he, uh, wow. he was like a, an, an urban legend at some point, you know, I think he oh, yeah. let, he dunked on Chris Weber in like a summer league game, like yeah, some little yeah, it was the Urban like Coalition in DC. I mean, and, uh, oh yeah, crazy. Rex. And by the way, uh, Chris Weber was one of our neighbors too. Uh, that's right, Wood Moore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Chris, Chris, and I played together there for a couple of years. Uh, yeah. Ken, Kenny but, uh, Walker but, lived but over Steve, there with me. Yeah. Yeah. But, but Steve, you know, he's done well. He's in Houston now. You know, he went through some problems, yeah. but he, he's really I think he's he's really doing well. I saw him um, a couple months ago and he's in shape. You know, he, he looks good. Yep. I think so, too. He, he's he gone through some stuff. Life life is hard like that. And, and you mentioned right. he was e- easy to coach. I don't recall, uh, you know, teammates liked Steve. Steve, like he, he wasn't a head case like that. He didn't no, give coaches no. issues and he didn't, you know, he's, he's just different. And uh, yeah. I'm really happy to see that he's doing well. Yeah. We, we had a player uh, named Walt Williams who played in the NBA. Walt the he wizard your, Williams. My, the wiz, I, the I played, soccer. we that were teammates DC. in Miami one year. Yeah. I love, I love, love that guy. Walt loves radio now for Maryland and he's, he's the best. The I, best. He, he, he probably saved my job because he kept us relevant those first couple of years. He was he's he still has the record in the ACC for scoring over 30 in eight consecutive league games. The <laughs> Wizards. The yeah. Wizards. He was the Walt Wizard. Williams. That's we right. played him every position possible on the court. If there was I the started, six, I would have played him there, too. Yeah, he, I he started sure. calling him. I started. I had never spent much time on the East Coast, and we were in Philly. We were driving across the Walt Whitman Bridge, yeah. and from that point on, he was Walt Whitman to me, and not Walt. <laughs> <laughs> Walt Whitman, not the Wizard. Um, coach, uh, you led Maryland back to back. Oh, before I get to that, I, I want to talk about Grievous Vasquez. I love that guy. 
um, was such a good player, won the Bob Cousy Award. Um, talk to me a little bit about coaching Grievous. He was amazing. Um, Venezuela, he's from Venezuela and um, grew up on outdoor courts, never really played in gyms growing up. And he came to uh, Montrose Christian where Kevin Durant went to high school yep. his senior year. And he, um, we tried to recruit Durant, obviously, uh, but we weren't, we weren't allowed to talk to Durant. That probably won't go there, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. But uh, there was this other guy in the gym that was, I, I think he was two years behind Durant. And he loved to play basketball, you know, and that, that always, I always thought if you're going to coach, you got to get guys that you like to coach. And you're, you're going to take talent. I mean, you, you know, you, you need to have a certain level of talent. But why take a guy that looked like you had to persuade him to play basketball? Right. You know, I'm, I'm not right. I wasn't good at that. <laughs> but, it, but if with Vasquez, every day was a great day. He'd walk in and he'd go, I can't believe I'm playing in a gym like this. This is unbelievable, you know. And, and he tried to win. He was another guy. He tried to win everything. Every drill we ever did in practice, he, he tried to win. And, um, he led the half court shooting at the end of practice. You know, he was, he thought he was a better half court shooter than everybody else. But the thing he did his freshman year, you know, he started and he did like, if he hit a three, he would do like a shimmy shake. Yeah. <laughs> and our fans, Hey, you know, they thought he was a hot dog. You know, they, yeah. you know, who's this guy, you know, coming in and doing all this stuff, but he could really play his, um, he scored uh, against Carolina in 2009 when Carolina won the national championship. He had 33, 12, and 10. We won at, at our place. Wow. And we, we, weren't, we weren't great then. We, we, were, we were good. We were good. His senior year, we played Duke. John Shire, the, the head yep. coach now, was their best guard, good player. They won that championship that year. We beat him at our place. We just had like 26 and 10. And he, he was – he loved playing good teams. I mean, he'd yeah. almost, um, you know, if we're playing like a, a money game, a guarantee game, Gravis, you know, I'd get a 16, 18, you know, but kind of <laughs> wasn't excited. But yeah. you, you play against somebody that was ranked. Oh, man, was, he, he was, was ready great. to go. Plus, and he could play. He was 6'6". Six, six, oh, yeah. And really long. I mean, and he could play. He played the point a lot for us. He played the two. He played the three. He, he, he was really good. He banged became, around in the NBA. He banged yeah, around in the he, NBA, and everywhere he went, he'd find his way in the rotation. His senior year. Yeah, he, he had bone on bone at the end in Ugh. the NBA for six years. But he's he's doing a lot with the kids in Venezuela now. He he does Good. things for them, and he lives in Miami. He's got a couple of kids, wife. He's doing really well. Fantastic. Um, I always think about with Maryland, I, always, I don't know. I always think of Juan Dixon. Yeah. And he just seemed like a, a winner, gutty, gritty, you know. What was it like to coach Juan? Well, it, it was tremendous. And I, I think with Juan, you know, he, he played with good players, but he, he was the all-time leading scorer. Or he is the all-time leading scorer. He was MVP of the Final Four, MVP of the ACC, um, second in the John Wooden Award uh, his senior year. And Juan was another guy that – he, you, you better come to practice ready to play because he was going to be ready to play. And he's, he's one of those guys who'd come back in the gym on the weekends. If you weren't, you know, we'd have three o'clock practice. He'd be in there eight o'clock at night shooting uh, on his own and things like that. He just worked very hard. And he went from, um, I, I'll never forget, he went to Calvert Hall uh, High School in Baltimore. We signed him and the Baltimore Sun, the uh, newspaper in Baltimore, said that Juan wrote an article saying that it was a mistake because he was too small to play in the ACC. Yeah. He, he, would, he would be overwhelmed by the physicalness of the league. And all he did was kick everybody's butt for, you know, his four years at uh, Maryland. So he, he was tremendous. And he, he made guys, he, he'd grab guys out of the dorm, make them come over and practice, you know, on their own, stuff like that. He, he was great. What's Fantastic. it like to have like a guy like that? Who It's like a, you know, he sets a culture like for years after because he's done that. The the, the freshman, oh, sophomore yeah. have seen him work like that. Does does that just carry over for years when you have a Juan Dixon? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you, you can point to that. Um, and the thing with Juan, he'd fight you in, in practice. In other words, it was it, was, it wasn't always smooth, but I, I really respected the fact that he he was that stubborn. That was part of him being a great player. He was so stubborn. 
uh, in what he believed he could do. We, we were playing um, uh, in Madison Square Garden in Coaches versus Cancer game. And it was Juan's first year, and he was like two for 14 from the field. And we came back from like 10 down. We had the ball, 20 seconds left. And um, we, we were setting up a play. And I, I ran it away from Juan. So he wasn't going to get the shot. <laughs> and he was mad. He said, I'm going to make it. He's two for 14. And he said, get me the ball. He said, I'll make it. And you know what? We missed the shot. And lost the game. <laughs> and he just looked at me after the game like, See, you know, it's like I was available. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> you know, uh, what's great, great what's great about that is you know, you talk about Juan and how tough and you know, when it's your best player, it's even that much better. I I had the luxury of trading for Steve Blake later as a member of the Denver Nuggets uh organization. I was sitting in practice the very first day Steve came in and we kind of got Steve, well, we got him as an emergency, you know, backup sure. kind of a, we looked at him as sort of a poor man, Steve Nash. And sure. uh, first practice he's I'm sitting with Steve's dad who has come in with his family. Uh, Steve was just married, had a, a little kid and right. his fir very first practice. And um, he and Nene kind of start talking a little bit to one another during this introductory practice for Steve Blake and the media and uh, the media hadn't come in just yet. And before I know it, Nene has, uh, Nene has hit Steve with a shoulder. Steve steps back and starts to swing and Nene grabbed him by the neck. And before I know it, I'm standing up. Steve's dad is standing up and Nene and Steve are just about to go at it. <laughs> and I'm going, I love this guy. <laughs> Yeah. I love it. And then after practice, they made up all that stuff. Steve Blake will fight you. And having yeah. a guy like Juan Dixon alongside another guy like yeah. Steve Blake, you had to have had one of the toughest teams in the country. Yeah. We, we used to kid him that our backcourt weighed 300 pounds, you know, they <laughs> guys. And, uh, you know, but I'll tell you what, nobody messed with him. And then, of course we had a guy named Lonnie Baxter. That's right. About 270. That if he even looked at Blake, he was ready yeah. to kill the, you know, the, the other guy. So it was pretty good. But Blake, I, Blake got in the fight um, before he played his freshman year in the summer at basketball camp. And it, it, they threw. They, they threw some yeah. punches. And, uh, uh, but Steve was one of the uh, best I've ever seen at, realize, at realizing what made him a good player. In other words, he yeah. never averaged double figures at Maryland. I think he averaged 9.5 for his career. Then he turns around and plays 13 years in the NBA. Yeah. Kobe Bryant loved Steve Blake, you know, when he was with the Lakers. And it was the way Steve approached the game. He'd shoot it, but only if the guy of uh, uh, Kobe Bryant, or Rex Chat, only if those guys didn't have shots, then he'd shoot it. And not many, you can't talk that into many guys, nope. even at the college level. They, yeah, but I'm good. You know, I, I got to get mine. You know, no, yeah. you don't have to get yours if he can get some. You know, it's right. like, but that's that's why he stayed in the league 13 years. That's right. Um, you've got uh, the distinction of having the most wins against number one teams in NCAA basketball history. A few of those came against Coach K uh, and the Blue Devils. How will you look back on Coach K's legacy and impact on college basketball? Well, to me, um, he first of all, he built that program. People think I, I think as time goes by, people think, well, he went to do they're a great basketball program. No, no. His first three years, he might have been fired at some places, but yeah. he had uh, a great athletic director who really believed in him and, and signed him to an extension after that third year when he hadn't won. Wow. And um, so what Coach K did was. I think uh, on parallel, because. Back in the day, John John Wooden obviously in his era was great, but they only played four games to win the NCAA That's championship. Right. Plus, they played in their region. There was no seeding. You didn't get pushed around the country to play. And so what he did um, at Duke, I, I'd say, especially in modern times, no one, no one did what Coach K did, you know, in terms of uh, length of time, the whole thing. He, he was just uh, – Incredible. And you knew you had to play. I, le I learned a lot. Uh, like I said, when I got there in 89, 
that was Grant Hill, Leitner, Hurley, you know, all those guys yeah. that are great. But they'd come out and they play hard every game. You, you couldn't find a tape where they didn't play hard. Then given their talent, you know, they, they were great. And, and I learned that. And that, that was part of the process at Maryland. We had to go after Duke. We had to go after North Carolina and Gene Smith. We, we, we weren't going to be good unless we could get to that level. And so, so those guys helped me. But, you know, Mike, Mike Krzyzewski, um, you know, his, his legacy, uh, I think, will be uh, those teams. When, when he had uh, Grant Hill and those guys, it was hard to complete a pass to get into your offense. Uh, later on, as he went more to the one and done, it became easier, the defense. Yeah. But part of that was he didn't have those guys for three, four years. So right. you don't build your defense like you once were able to That's do. That's right. And I think – he really enjoyed those years in the 90s uh, more so than, say, the last five or six years, even though they were very good. Uh, but uh, he loved to coach. You know, that, that's the best thing. He didn't play golf. He didn't do anything. He just he just coached. I wow. said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm going to coach the USA team this summer. And I said, let's be on the first tee, you know. <laughs> it's like – when uh, I, before we let you go, coach, and thanks for spending so much time with us today, I want to get your take real quick on the NIL, and not I don't I don't think so much the NIL, but from a coaching standpoint, you know, you coached all of us knuckleheads coming up at 17, 18, 19 years old, before you know, before we had any money. When you have 17, 18 year olds coming into campus, I don't know, with a million dollars or half a million dollars before and before they're great players. Right. How did, before they've how, done anything. Before they've done anything. Haven't even proven themselves on that level yet. How difficult uh, would that be? Say, say for yourself. Well, just. It's it's just incredible. I, I talked to some coaches now, head coaches, ma major conferences. They spend 30, 35 percent of their time trying to put together, you know, get people to join these uh, consortiums right. to have money to be able to get. Uh, you're, you're not going to get a top 20 player anymore unless, you know, you have a couple million that you can kind of dig into uh, to get that kid. So that's one thing. But the other thing is, how do you coach a kid? that um, basically, and, and couple this with the transfer pool. Mm -hmm. How do you coach a kid? He might be getting 100,000. Say he's a good player. Not, not the best, but he gets 100. Say he gets 100. All right. You don't play him a lot of minutes. He's a freshman. He's not as good as people thought he was, you know, the whole thing. First thing he does, if you yell at him, you got to work harder. You, you, you got to do this, this, and this. Oh, really? I'm going to the transfer pool. So now he goes in there and he gets bid on in there. In other words, oh, you're getting 100. Well, we'll give you 150. Well, this school over here will give you 200. And it's legal. It, 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 no, nobody's cheating. It, it's, it's legal. But it, it's, it's devalued um, the education process for sure. Um, you know, very few yeah. kids. I don't even talk about, um, you know, graduation rates anymore. Right. I mean, that's gone, you know, from right. uh, college, college basketball. But it's 35 years ago, I was with some other coaches. We went to the NCAA and asked them to please change the scholarships for men's basketball and football. And so they would have done, you know, with a woman basketball right. too, and probably volleyball or something like that. And we, we can't, you can't treat these guys the same because all of a sudden basketball was making a lot of money for schools. Right. And the NCAA looked at us like, Oh, no, everything has to be the same for everyone. And I go, no, it, 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 these can. guys are the moneymakers. You know, yeah. And if they would have started to do some things to make the scholarship better back then, I don't think yeah. we'd get to this point where we I are. I agree. Right now. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I agree with that. The, the thing I go back to is that I, and I try to think about, you know, just personally. Right. Um, I don't know what the incentive is unless you just have it in you. And I, for me, it, 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 I just like to play uh, and it yeah. was, it was fun. Um, so I was lucky in that regard, but for, and maybe even for myself, I, what's the incentive to be great. You've got a lot of work to do. I don't care who you are from the time you leave high school 
until you step foot in an NBA locker room <laughs> or a professional locker room, wherever it is, there's a lot of work that, to be done. And if you've already, if you're not that self-motivated where, you know, you've got those, those years, those first couple college years are, they're so, yes. they were so important to me. If I hadn't had Eddie Sutton's defensive teaching for two years to where yeah. I've got some kind of idea how to guard yeah. I would have flamed right out. And uh, I, I just wonder where the incentive to be great comes from if you just don't have it in you, if you need it to be prodded a little. I, I, I don't. Kids don't want to be yelled at. In other words, co my, my coach in college, uh, I was scared to death of him. No <laughs> Me idea. too. I mean, he played for <laughs> Hank Iver back in the day. Hank Iver would practice three times a day at Oklahoma State. He didn't, he didn't care about that anything except yeah. his team. And most of those practices were defense. So uh -huh. we played like all defense when I was in college. We played 60 point games. And, it was, you know, and I grew up in Philly where, you, you know, you played in the playgrounds and you ran. And, yeah. you know, and all of a sudden I go to college and, wow, you know, <laughs> I wasn't allowed to shoot. <laughs> That's anytime a player says, I don't get enough shots, I said, hey, let me tell you this song. <laughs> I started, I started, I started at Maryland. I took like three shots a game, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you miss, you were probably coming you're out. Coming out. But, but I mean that that's the, the discipline you got from coaches like Eddie Sutton or Bud Melikin or, um, you know, a Shashevsky, a Dean Smith. That not only affected you basketball wise. I always thought that 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 made you tougher when things didn't go right for you. Yeah. You know, after you got out of college or whatever, you always had that in the back of your mind. Like, well, how did I survive that practice? How how yeah. was I able? to play, you know, what, what made me tough enough to play. So that, that, that to me was the greatest thing in coaching when players valued what you had to say, even though you didn't say it the way they like to hear it a lot of times. And I, I was a screamer, you know, when I coached, yeah. uh, I mean, but my guys, they, they knew we were trying to get good. They knew I was trying to make each guy better and it didn't always work, but that's what you were trying to do. And right. when you get players that understand that, that's when you have the good teams. I, I, yeah. I'm a big believer in that. Yeah. What, Coach. What do you, what do you, uh, uh, real quickly, just what, what do you think the game has changed so oh, much yeah. and just happened so quickly? And you look at just the NBA, you talk about games 60. I mean, they do that in a quarter now and the three point shot. And, and, you know, we're both Kentucky guys, Rex and I. And it's like, here you got a guy like Oscar Shibwe who's the player of the year and average 16 rebounds and comes back to Kentucky because he can't get drafted for the NBA game. It's just <laughs> not like, where do you see the game going at this point? Well, I, I guess that's, that's where they want it to be. Uh, I think the three point line uh, has had much more impact than the shot clock did on yeah. uh, basketball in general. And uh I hate that corner three because the, the corner three, I guess, Rex, you know this better than me, but that's the closest three, yeah. that one from the corner. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see the three-point line go around the top of the circle, but then go straight out to the sideline at a certain point down the lane so that you defensively you could come in and help. And if you got back late, you only gave up a two. And, uh, and like, I've yeah, never I, heard I, of that. That's, that's, yeah, I like I, that. Well, it, yeah. the, the problem is the, the game is, is, is based on, you know, the, the high ball screen is like, it's almost like I'd like to turn off the TV while somebody runs a high ball screen. If they run any other play, okay, I'll, I'll watch. <laughs> you know, but the, the high ball screen is like, geez, do something else. I mean, I don't care if it's good, bad, or, or, but every team, you know, they, uh, the, the pros and you, you you know better than yeah. me. But well, we have 80 plays. Oh, yeah. Well, I saw I, I saw a side screen over here. And I saw <laughs> the top of the circle. They're, they're the plays I see every game. And plus, guys, like you say, that are great basketball players. There's got to be a place for them. I, I, and, I, and I think it's going to – the pendulum will swing where you will have teams that have the ability to go inside and shoot to three. you got to shoot to three. Yeah. But, you know – the ability when the three's not going in these teams that shoot 45, 50 threes and make 12, you can't change your offense halfway through. They're, they're not going to go in tonight. You know, you got to figure out a way to go get the ball inside. So I think some teams and golden state might be a little close to that, you know, in terms, yeah. all, you know, because of Curry, all the you know, three pointers and all this, 
but they know how to get that uh, medium range jumper too. They're pretty good. Coach, what's your favorite movie? Favorite movie. Oh man. You know, when I was coaching, I never went to a movie, but <laughs> my favorite movie of all time and showing my age, uh, Butch Cassidy and his Sundance. Kid. Fantastic. Tremendous. Fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Grew up with my parents. Yeah, I watched about, that with my parents. Uh, you could, yeah, I watched it with my dad. Yeah, he uh -huh. loved that movie. Yeah, um, now you're making me feel yeah. bad. That's, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching it with my great granddad. He, he <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. what did uh what about if you could sit front row center for any entertainer, dead or alive, anyone just that you could watch? Speaker, anybody. Any entertainer, right? Yep. Um, David Bowie. Oh, yes. I thought he Fantastic. was he was so flexible in what he did. He could he could do anything. I mean, he, he could sing any song. I thought he was true. That's fantastic. Awesome. Coach, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Please come hey, back. Rich. Let's let, let's do it again uh, during basketball season. I'd love to. And uh, great reconnected. You know, it's great. You're looking great, coach. Keep doing whatever you're doing. I'm hanging in there. It's the fourth <laughs> quarter. Thanks, buddy. Talk to All you right, soon. Thanks. <laughs> See you. Guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Coach. All right. Okay, thank you. Josh. Yo. Yo. Gary Williams. That's Gary Williams, that Josh. Great. Yeah. Yep. Legend. Legend. My favorite part was right at the other end when, first of all, who would think that Gary Williams' favorite entertainer would be David, David Bowie? David Bowie. And, and Kenny Anderson's like, favorite. And he's like, I love David Bowie. Yeah. <laughs> Love, love. That yeah, was, that, I was wouldn't awesome. have, that was a surprise. And then who did Kenny Anderson like? Who did we? Who did Kenny Anderson say he liked? It was somebody uh, totally opposite from what we thought it would yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. I get, but yeah, yeah David Bowie, Gary Williams. When Gary came on the screen, immediately I I looked at him and I just assumed somebody was going to yell, "Get on the line." You know, because Gary was a yeller and screamer, much like my dad. Yeah, was. Was. He's got that demeanor. Yeah. But what a pleasant guy. He's so not yeah. that guy. He looks great, too. He doesn't looks he? great. I mean, I, I don't know what I was expecting, but he looks exactly I like he did 25 either. years ago. Right? And he does, because I was preparing myself to see Gary Williams now because, I, mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes it is. We like, haven't Whoa. seen him in a while. You know, he looks great. Yeah. And it's so like he runs 10 mind's miles eye, a day. He looks like my mind's eye would think Gary Williams looks like instead of 77 year old Gary Williams. He looks great. Yeah. I love. And, you yeah. Know. He was fantastic. He's old school, old school yeller. He, he disciplined. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, a couple was, of the things yeah. that he said, you know, right away it, that just, you know, it's it is it's a it's a difficult thing going and not only recruiting young men, um, but the way the rules were constructed, you know, you couldn't really even get to know them, uh, especially in recent years. The ability to go and find guys that like to play that are self starters. Yeah. He said, you know, that's the one thing I can't really I don't want to have a guy that I've got to motivate to get in the gym. He talked about Grievous Vasquez and, and Steve Blake and Juan Dixon. And those guys were all guys that would pull other guys to the gym just to go be in the gym. Right. They liked being in the right. gym. And finding those guys is a real skill. It really is, because everybody wants those guys, right? Yeah, well, you know, they in reading, reading up and, and studying, you know, he was known for um his teams had his personality yeah and he was a grinder yep, you know he, he, was. he wasn't uh, you know mr mcdonald's all-american in fact that team that won with no mcdonald's all-americans was the first team ever to win a national championship without any mcdonald's all-americans since there was mcdonald's all americans that's crazy it was like the first team so that's amazing yeah 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 that's yeah. so his personality and 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 you know, yeah, you have those players, Juan Dixon, that pull people in, but it, it's him that, yeah. that gets those players and, and motivates those players. You know, that uh, it was a thrill to have him.
That was Gary Williams. We'll see you next time on the Rex Chapman Show with super cool Josh Hopkins right here, powered by basketballnews.com.